In this presentation, I'll be providing a high-level overview of the Common Community Physics Package, or CCPP. A large number of folks have contributed to the CCPP in some way. It is a community effort, after all. But the folks listed on the slide are those who have perhaps spent the most time on this project within the DTC. I'm Grant Furl, and will be presenting this material. But a lot of credit should be given to Dom Heinzeller, Lija Brenner Day, Laurie Carson, Man Zhang, and Julie Schramm. In this presentation, I hope to provide at least cursory answers to the following questions you may have about the CCPP and how it relates to the wider UFS. First and foremost, what is the CCPP? Then I'll discuss how it fits within a modeling system in general, and specifically the UFS. Next, I'll discuss how parameterizations are assembled into physics suites to run within the UFS. Following that, I'll provide some details about what is special about a parameterization to be used within the CCPP and how the UFS, or any model, needs to provide information about the data it provides to the physics. Finally, for context, I'll step back and provide a brief history of this project and where it currently is being used, and then talk about where this project is going in the short term and, by extension, how these plans might affect the UFS. First, I'd like to start out with the genesis story of this project, or what motivated the CCPP to be born in the first place. And it starts with a set of goals for UFS physics that were defined by NGGPS leadership. First, there should be a consolidated library of physics routines that can be used for both operational and research needs that is suitable for all UFS applications. Second, this library should be well supported and be accessible to the weather and climate community. Third, the library should be open and follow community-oriented development practices, such as utilizing Git for version control and GitHub for sharing code and coordinating development. Fourth, each physics scheme should have a clear, well-defined interface that is also well-documented. This should facilitate using and enhancing existing parameterizations, as well as providing a target or a template for new parameterizations to follow. Fifth, physics schemes should ideally be interoperable in the sense that they should be usable across many die cores. This should ultimately lower barriers to scientific exchange, with respect to physics anyway, across organizations, much like standardization of mechanical parts, electric building codes, or countless other examples in modern society. So the CCPP was created in an effort to meet all of these goals. The CCPP has been organized into two distinct software repositories, both of which exist on GitHub. The first is to house actual physics parameterization routines, their interfaces to the CCPP, and all dependencies. Its main branch contains the latest UFS operational physics, as well as candidates being considered for future operational implementation. Public releases are typically cut from this main branch, with a subset of its parameterizations enjoying support to the community, with ample documentation and cross-platform testing. Other branches under the authoritative fork can contain parameterizations under active development, and other third-party forks exist to house CCPP-compliant parameterization development from other institutions. In addition, the CCPP physics repository can also contain Git submodules itself when a scheme's authoritative repository is under the control of a third party. The second software repository houses the so-called CCPP framework. It consists of scripts and tools that form a generalized software framework for connecting a set of physics parameterizations with a host application. This framework is designed to be model agnostic, and its use and development is shared across several institutions. Typically, the host model would need to use both of these repositories, and the UFS has both as nested submodules under the FE3 submodule. Now that we know what the CCPP is in a broad sense, let's get into how it works within a generalized host model and inside the UFS. In this diagram, the atmosphere driver box represents the main calling program. Perhaps it is the die core in some models, or perhaps it is another software layer, but it is typically responsible for time integration, calling all connected components, and maintaining a model's state. The CCPP physics on this diagram 
corresponds to the CCPP physics repository and, as shown, is a collection of physics parameterizations with potentially more than one of each type. For example, several different microphysics schemes, convection schemes, etc. One of the keys of the entire CCPP is that each of these physics schemes will have an associated file containing metadata. We'll get into the details of what this metadata looks like in a minute, but in short, it contains information about what variables a physics scheme needs to perform its function and its output. It is a complete description of its data interface in a way that the CCPP framework can understand. Likewise, on the host model side, there must be similar metadata files in a special format that describe what variables it can provide to the physics and how and where it exists in the host's data model. At model build time, the CCPP framework scripts are invoked to read metadata from the host and metadata from the physics to construct or auto-generate a software cap that acts like a custom-made physics driver. At build time, the CCPP framework must also be given a description of the physics suite or suites for which to construct one or more software caps. The description of those physics suites is accomplished through suite definition files, or SDFs. Each suite should have its own SDF, and they may be host model dependent and stored in the host model software repository. Each SDF is an XML file with a schema that uses the following hierarchy. The top level element is the suite, which defines the suite's name and carries a version attribute that corresponds to the version of the XML schema file. Underneath the suite element are one or more group elements. All schemes contained within a group will be called together in sequence. Importantly, however, the group elements allow for non-physics code to be executed between groups. This can provide all kinds of flexibility for various physics dynamics coupling or for any other functionality a host model needs to call in between physics groups. Within each group, the next element is called subcycle. This element controls how many times each scheme within is called. While this is typically one, this can be useful to call a set of physics at a shorter time step or to implement an iteration. The finest grain element is the scheme itself, which contains the name of a scheme as a string. To make this information a little more concrete, let's look at the SDF for the operational GFS suite. Notice the four different elements and how they're arranged. We see the top-level suite tag that names the physics configuration, several groups within that top-level tag, several subcycle tags within groups, and each scheme to be called by its name. Since the suite is split into five groups, this allows for the host model to perform other operations between the execution of the groups. For example, in this suite, the fast physics group is part of the GFDL microphysics scheme that gets called from within the die core for tighter coupling with the dynamics. The die core finishes its execution in between the fast physics group and the next physics group. Also, the subcycle functionality is used to create a two step iteration for the surface schemes. Notice that the subcycle element encompassing the surface-based schemes has a loop equals 2 attribute, whereas other subcycle elements have loop equals 1, signifying a single execution. Another thing to note is that the CCPP framework creates caps for both the entire suite as a whole and for individual groups. This allows host models the flexibility to call the entire suite at once if no computation is needed in between groups or with more granularity by group. For example, the CCPP single column model uses the entire suite cap, whereas FE3 calls the group caps. One may notice that within this suite, there are many more schemes than one might expect. There are on the order of 10 subgrid scale physics processes that are typically parameterized, yet there are more than 50 schemes to be executed in this suite. Why is this? So this brings up an important distinction. The CCPP does not organize schemes by type. That is, there are no predefined categories like microphysics, convection, radiation, etc. that a scheme must fit into.
as long as a piece of code complies with the rules to be discussed in a bit. It doesn't really matter what is inside. This allows for glue code, typically found in a traditional physics driver, to be fit into a CCPP suite. We call schemes that fit the traditional definition of a physics scheme, code that parameterizes some subgrid scale physical process, a primary scheme, and schemes that contain glue code as interstitial schemes, or code that fits in between the primary schemes. These interstitial schemes perform functions like data preparation and diagnostics that allow primary schemes to function together as a suite. These are often host-specific. For example, if the UFS expects that a specific diagnostic be calculated for output, but it is not calculated within a primary scheme, an interstitial scheme is employed to do so. In the extreme case, where all diagnostics are handled by the host application outside of physics, and all primary schemes used within a suite provide exactly the data needed by a subsequent schemes, a SDF could be constructed of entirely primary schemes. To the extent that a SDF uses many interstitials, this signals that there is a lot of diagnostics and or data laundering going on. So far, we've discussed what the CCPP is, how it fits within a host application and within the UFS, and how a physics suite is defined. Next, I'm going to discuss what is special about a scheme that works with the CCPP, or what makes a scheme so-called CCPP compliant. I'll first mention the attributes of such a scheme on this slide, and then go into each in more detail in subsequent slides. In short, it's mostly about the scheme's interface. First off, the scheme's code must be contained within a Fortran module. Within that module, subroutines for at least one of the five CCPP phases must be present. The phases correspond to the model initialization, time step initialization, time step execution, or integration, time step finalization, and model finalization, each of which share their subroutine root names with the name of the module. For example, if the scheme module is called foo, the subroutines within can be called foo init, foo time step init, foo run, foo time step finalize, and foo finalize. The init phase is executed once at the beginning of a model run, and the finalize phase is executed once at the completion of a model run. The time step init and time step finalize subroutines are executed at the beginning and the end of each physics time step. The run phase is called at least once every physics time step. Should the associated phase be unnecessary for the scheme, it's allowable for any of the subroutines to be omitted. Most importantly, and the fuel that drives the CCPP, is metadata. There should be metadata describing all arguments to the non-empty subroutines. This is key. Other requirements are special error handling characteristics, adherence to modern coding standards, and scientific and technical documentation using Doxygen markup. Now, let's take a look at an example CCPP compliant scheme's code structure. First, notice that the code exists within a Fortran module and that for this scheme, there are subroutines to be executed during the initialization and run phases. They share their root module name with init and run appended. Note, be sure to label the end statements for both the subroutines and module. Another thing to note are the special Doxygen formatted hooks for subroutines used during the defined CCPP phases. This does double duty as a signal for the CCPP framework parser and as an insertion point for an automatically generated HTML table for the generated scientific documentation. It is important that these lines exist for proper execution of the CCPP framework. Speaking of metadata, let's dive into what this looks like in detail. A scheme's metadata is placed into a separate file with the same root name but with a .meta extension. The metadata file serves at least three purposes. The first is to provide information to the CCPP framework about what data the scheme needs as well as what it outputs or produces. The second is to serve as documentation for scheme arguments. The third purpose is to provide information to the CCPP framework about the scheme's build time dependencies. Looking at the file contents, 
it uses a relaxed config file format with defined sections for each subroutine in the Fortran code with a CCPP compliant interface. Each section begins with the name of the subroutine and a type that describes what kind of entity the metadata is describing, in this case, a scheme. Afterward, all variables that are part of a subroutine's argument list are included, with attributes for each variable following. Let's look at the kind of metadata that is expected for each variable. First, we have the local name of the variable as it is known in the argument list of the subroutine in brackets. Following that is perhaps the most important piece of metadata, the variable's standard name. This is a unique identifier for the variable and is how the CCPP knows or tracks a variable. Every CCPP scheme that uses a given variable and every host that provides a given variable should use the same standard name. These standard names are based on the CF conventions, although the CCPP is in the process of extending these guidelines for our use. A well-defined set of rules for constructing new names is under development. Afterward, it's the so-called long name. This attribute serves more of a documentation role, especially if the standard name is insufficiently detailed. The units attribute is critical. The format is such that any exponents immediately follow the unit abbreviation. The next attribute is the dimensions of the variable. It is a comma-separated, parentheses-bound list of dimensions by their standard names. It can be an empty set of parentheses for a scalar variable, it can specify a start and end through use of standard names, or if a standard name is given for the dimension, it's implied that the dimension starts with 1 and spans to the specified value. The type attribute corresponds to a variable's Fortran intrinsic data type or a derived data type name. Although derived data types are discouraged, especially for data that gets passed between schemes, they can be used in the CCPP, especially where they can remain internal to one scheme and any tightly associated interstitial schemes. In general, however, derived data types limit a scheme's portability due to the need for a host model to know about the type definition. The kind attribute is used to denote precision of a variable, especially reals or floating point values and character variables. The intent attribute is another critical one and corresponds to the actual Fortran argument intent for how a variable is used within. This can be in, in, out, or out. The last thing to point out about a CCPP scheme's metadata is a section called CCPP Table Properties that applies to the entire scheme, not just one subroutine within. It has fields for a scheme's name, the type, which should be scheme for all CCPP schemes, and a list of file dependencies to be used by the CCPP framework to inform the host application's build system. It is especially useful for compiling only those files that are necessary for a given list of suites, rather than all files within the CCPP. Another factor that a scheme needs to take into account to be CCP compliant is its error handling. A CCPP compliant scheme is not allowed to stop a host model or otherwise write out error messages. Instead, it should make use of the CCPP error message and CCPP error code variables. If a scheme detects an error, it should set CCPP error code to a non-zero value, set CCPP error message to a string describing the error, and return to the calling procedure. The CCPP software framework returns these error variables to the host model, who can then stop the model gracefully. Documenting a CCPP compliant scheme makes use of specially formatted in-source comments. These comments are parsed by the Doxygen software to produce human-readable content while being subject to version control along with the rest of the code. Although such documentation is not required for the scheme to work within the CCPP software framework, it is highly encouraged for developers to adequately document their algorithms for future maintenance and potential improvement. Detailed instructions for adhering to the desired format are included on the CCPP website, and many examples exist within the existing CCPP repository for format replication as well. Examples of the documentation produced can be found at this link. The documentation includes a description of the arguments, a high-level description of the algorithm, 
and often a detailed description of the algorithm with equations and references. To sum up the documentation component, CCPP schemes use Doxygen inline markup. These comments are typically additive to existing source code documentation, not necessarily a replacement. The metadata file that exists for each CCPP compliant scheme is parsed as part of the documentation generation process into an HTML table that is displayed in the browser readable output. The content of the documentation should give a user a good understanding of how the scheme works scientifically, or at least point the user to where they can learn about it. Although in general, it is not the goal of the CCPP project to enforce a particular coding style or method, it is important that some minimum coding requirements are met. Following these requirements should aid future maintenance and portability of CCPP compliant schemes. Although examples of older standards of Fortran exist within the CCPP physics repository, new schemes should choose to follow the Fortran 90 standard up to the Fortran 2008 standard. Next, labeled end statements of modules and subroutines are required for proper parsing of the code by the CCPP framework. Also, using implicit none is required, preferably at the module level. If a variable is labeled as intent out, it must be set within the routine. In addition, variables that contain domain-dependent data cannot be kept using the save attribute. Further, go to statements should not be used and common blocks are forbidden. Finally, as a reminder, scheme should not stop or abort the model and IO should be contained within the init subroutine, like for reading lookup tables. Please see the written documentation for further details, including rules for parallel programming. So, in a nutshell, that is what makes a physics scheme, or any piece of code, CCPP compliant. But how does a host model like the UFS use the CCPP? In the next few slides, I'll discuss some aspects of how this works. For those wanting more details, Chapter 6 of the CCPP technical documentation linked here provides those. For this talk, I'll be discussing metadata on the host side, use of the CCPP API to call suites or groups within a suite, use of parallelism within the CCPP, and what the CCPP framework is doing at build time. Just like on the physics side, the CCPP requires that metadata exist on the host application side. By ingesting both metadata from the physics and host, the CCPP framework is able to auto-generate the software caps that pass in the correct data to the physics. For the UFS, most of the host metadata exists in the GFS typedefs.meta and CCPP typedefs.meta files at the given paths within the UFS. Other files also have host metadata. For example, any Fortran modules that define derived data types will have an associated metadata file. There are a few differences between physics side metadata and host side. First, at the beginning of the metadata table, the type attribute should say module or DDT for derived data type, depending on the table's context. Second, the intent attributes don't really have any meaning on the host side, so those are omitted. Finally, there is an attribute called active that is set to a Fortran logical expression using CCPP standard names. Since some variables are conditionally allocated based on which physics schemes are actually active, this attribute lets the CCPP framework know under what circumstances the given variable is allocated and can be used within physics schemes. For example, some diagnostic variables are only calculated when a flag is set, so the active attribute for those variables would be set to an expression that evaluates to true when that flag is true. Next. Let's talk about how CCPP physics are actually used within the host application. During the build process, the CCPP framework auto-generates an API for the host application to use, consisting of the calls on this slide. Note that all of these calls are suite-dependent, that is, they take a suite name and or group name as arguments. The auto-generated file is called ccppstaticapi.f90, and its placement in the source directory structure is controlled via the CCPP framework configuration. All calls correspond to using the five phases of physics execution. The CCPP physics init call starts the init stage of all physics schemes in the given suite. 
in the order in which they appear in the SDF. The physics initialization stage is when functions such as reading lookup tables, reading input data sets, computing derived quantities, broadcasting information to all MPI ranks, etc. takes place. Initialization procedures are typically done for the entire domain, that is, they are not subdivided by blocks. Similarly, many, but not all, parameterizations need to be finalized, which includes functions such as deallocating variables, resetting flags from initialized to non-initialized, etc. This is the function of the CCPP physics finalize call. Initialization and finalization functions are each performed once per run, before the first call to the physics and after the last call to the physics, respectively. The CCPP physics time stepping it and CCPP physics time step finalize calls are called at the beginning and end of each physics time step and are often used for time only dependent code and diagnostics. The CCPP physics run call is where the run stage of an entire suite or group within a suite is executed. These calls are placed within the time integration loop of the host application and are thus executed every physics time step. For the UFS, all of these API calls are written into an additional software layer found in a file called ccppdriver.f90 under fe3 slash ccpp slash driver. Although some host models use the API calls directly in their code without the additional software layer. Next, you may be wondering about how the CCPP works with parallelized code. The CCPP was implemented with a couple of overarching paradigms related to parallelism. First, physics are assumed to be column-based only, and no communication between columns related to physics is expected during time integration. Second, physics initialization and finalization are independent of the larger threading strategy of the host application. So, in practice, for MPI, this means that MPI communication is only allowed during physics initialization and finalization, and that, should it be used for these phases, it should use an MPI communicator provided by the host application and not MPI COM world. For OpenMP, the time integration of physics, the run phase of each scheme, can be called by multiple threads. So, threading is allowed inside a physics scheme but it should use the number of OpenMP threads provided by the host application. If you've been paying attention up to this point, you've no doubt noticed that I've mentioned auto-generated code many times. All of this auto-generation happens at build time. Python scripts are at the heart of the CCPP framework, and they are invoked at build time. The scripts are given a set of suite definition files, as well as the location of metadata files from the host application and the physics. The scripts then read all scheme metadata for each given suite, read all host metadata, and match host provided variables with physics requested variables. The outputs of the scripts are the auto generated suite and group caps, the auto generated CCPP static API.f90 with definitions for all of the CCPP physics run, etc. calls, and auto generated makefile information for compiling both the physics and the auto-generated caps within the host's build system. In the UFS, all of this happens behind the scenes as part of the build system, and users can happily remain ignorant of the details, although familiarity with the process may be important for development and debugging. At this point, hopefully you have a good idea about what the CCPP is, how it fits within the UFS, how physics suites are defined, what makes a piece of code CCPP compliant, and how the UFS uses the CCPP. The last few slides exit the realm of the technical and ascend to the programmatic to provide a bit more context. First, a bit of history. The CCPP is a relatively new project, having begun in earnest in 2016. It started with collecting requirements from EMC and NGGPS discussing and refining them with the ESPC Physics Interoperability Group and the NGGPS Physics Workshop in 2017, and having them approved and signed by Michael Farrar and Fred Tepfer in October 2017. Design and development began around that time and continues through today. The first public releases, all of which included a simple single column model as demonstration, occurred in 2018 through 2019. 
although it was implemented within some versions of FE3 during this time frame as well. In 2018, we began the collaboration with NCAR and NRL, which is still ongoing to this day. In 2019, the CCPP was adopted by NOAA EMC for development, after which we conducted an in-person training the same year. In the spring of 2020, the CCPP was released alongside the first public release of the UFS Medium Range Weather app, with a minor update in the fall of the same year. In November 2020, the CCPP was covered as part of the UFS training, and version 5 with the UFS Short Range Weather app was released in March of 2021. Version 6 was also released alongside the UFS Short Range Weather app in June 2022. The CCPP is projected to officially be part of NOAA Operational NWP in the 2023-2024 timeframe. As discussed in the previous slide, there have been several public releases of the CCPP since the spring of 2018. Each release provided a well-documented, multi-platform tested snapshot of the code, with support provided by either a help desk in the earlier releases or a forum in more recent ones. Typically, a small number of CCPP suites were officially supported, with many other CCPP compliant schemes provided for research and development. Since the CCPP requires a host application to work, it has always been released with a single column model to provide a simple example implementation. The first three releases officially were with a single column model only, yet versions 2 and 3 worked with developmental branches of the FE3 code on GitHub. Version 4, released in 2020, was the first to be publicly released alongside the FE3 via the UFS Medium Range Weather app version 1 release. Version 4.1 included mainly bug fixes and support for Python 3. Version 5 was released alongside the UFS Short Range Weather app version 1 release. Version 6 was released in conjunction with the UFS Short Range Weather app version 2. Now, I'll briefly show the components of the currently supported suites. The operational GFS suite, known as GFS v16 in this table, is the first supported suite using GFDL Microphysics, the ScaleAware TKE-based Moist PBL scheme, GFS Surface Layer, ScaleAware Simplified Arakawa Schubert Deep and Shallow Convection, RRTMG Radiation, the Unified Gravity Wave Physics Scheme, the NOAA Land Surface Model, and Ozone and Stratospheric Water Vapor Schemes from NRL. Another supported suite, GFS V17P8, builds upon the V16 suite. The main differences from V16 to V17P8 being the Thomson Cloud Microphysics, the NOAA GSL Drag Suite, and the NOAA MP Land Surface Model. The other suites in this table include additional CCPP compliant schemes not mentioned as part of the UFS supported suites, but are available for research and development purposes. To provide even larger context than the UFS, the CCPP is slated to be used in some way by several flagship models from multiple institutions, notably including NCAR and the Naval Research Laboratory. The CCPP is well positioned to become a standard across modeling institutions. In my opinion, the extent to which the standard is adopted will dictate whether the dream of easily sharing physics across institutions, academia, and the broader community is realized. Finally, I'd like to draw your attention to more resources to learn more about the CCPP. First of all, you can read FAQs, post new questions, read solutions to previous questions, and interact with other users via either the CCPP or UFS forums linked on this slide. Second, Check out some instructional videos posted on YouTube under the DTC's channel. Look for the CCPP playlist. More how-to videos may be added in the future should the demand be there. Finally, be sure to check out both the CCPP technical documentation on Read the Docs, as well as existing scientific documentation for the supported CCPP physics suites.